it's a great honor and a privilege to introduce Professor Dr. Livia Bitton Jackson. We're here in Yerushalayim. And Livia, your story is absolutely unbelievable and incredible. Yes. But could you tell us a little bit about your family history? Yes. Well, first of all, my name, Bitton Jackson. My personal family name, my maiden name, is Friedman. We were with a family of Friedman in a small town in Czechoslovakia, 18 kilometers from the capital of Slovakia, which is Bratislava. And um, my father had a grocery store, but he was a big Talmud Chacham, so he was also teaching privately uh, groups of children, simply taught Gemara, and um, some Tanakh, but he was so learned that people didn't leave him alone. They always bothered him to teach and to give lectures. So he was quite an unusual person. His name was Mordechai Friedman. And we had a corner house in the town and my father's business name was, you know, Mark Friedman's Grocery Store. It was more or less like an, in the town, a special place. So much so that four years ago, I was back in Czechoslovakia for a reason that I'll tell you later. And there, they, they, there is a tall tower, and on it it says the Friedman Corner. Wow. So the Friedman Corner became, a, what should I say, like a street name or, or a, uh, whatever. I don't know what to call it. But the Friedman Corner was so amazing, I couldn't believe it. And people knew about the Friedman Corner. That was the name of a place in that town. And the town also became much, much bigger. Now they have a, a, a beautiful theater, and they asked me to give a talk to the high school boys. And so, the theater back, like a, a separate area in the theater, that's where I spoke to about 200 students. It's an amazing change and an amazing thing that the Jews are remembered. There is a, a sign that says, this is in memory of the Jews of Shamorim was the name of the town. And uh, there is a, a non-Jew, a Goy, his name is Chaba Kish. And he, he is the one who established a, a memorial in the synagogue, our local synagogue, is beautifully renovated and in the hall inside they have like a cultural center of Czechoslovakia commemorating the Jews of Shamori. It's very interesting. I found it very, very moving. So, uh, now, I was, I had only one brother my father, my mother, my brother, a 40 years older brother, and my mother had a sister in the town, an older sister, she was a widow. She had no children. So when we were taken away, she joined us. And then we were, of course, put in the trains and taken to Auschwitz in 1944 the beginning of uh, June. And uh, when we got to Auschwitz, the story was that all 
the children up to the age of 16 were selected out and sent to the gas chambers. So my best friend, Waldman Bobby, and her mother and another good friend, Marty Goldstein, and her mother, we were all together. And as they were let through, in the left lane, I also was walking with them, with my mother. And then Mengele, Joseph Mengele, the Malach Hamavet, Yemach Shemo. I looked like a German girl, I didn't look Jewish. I had long blonde braids, and uh, I was much taller than the average girl of my age. So with being tall, blue-eyed, and with the blonde braids, he saw me and he stopped me. I was already on the other side, which was actually a few meters away from the gas chambers. And uh, he called me back and he said to me, Du, come to me in German, you come back. And he said to me, Bist du Jüdin? Are you Jewish? Here I am in Auschwitz. <laughs> He's asking me if I'm Jewish. I said, yeah, I've been Jüdin. And he took one of my braids and he says, Was für eine schöne goldene Haare hast du? What beautiful golden hair you have. And I was shaking like a leaf because here is an assessment in German and we were so frightened. And I don't know what he wanted from me. And he said to me, Wie alt bist du? How old are you? I said, Ich bin 13 Jahre alt. I'm 13. And he says, 13? He said, Now remember, do you see the girls on the right who are marching there? They are 16 years old. He says, Remember from now on, you are 16 and join them and you march together with them. But remember, from now on, anybody who's asking you, you are 16. So I started to walk to the right, and my mother got so frightened that they ta taking her little girl away. She opened her eyes big, she had big blue eyes, and he said to me, is this Dania Mutter? Is this your mother? And I said, yes. He said, mother, gave me Dania Tochter. Go with your daughter. And my mother walked, started to walk with me. But together with us was my mother's sister, Aunt Serena. She was a widow. She had no children. And I was her favorite person. She always cuddled me. And she started shouting in Hungarian, Laura, please don't leave me. So my mother turned to Mengele and said, Herr Officer, can my Schwester come and meet uns? Can my sister come with us? And he looked at her and she was not tall and she was not blonde and she did not have blue eyes. She had big brown eyes, she was a beautiful lady. And he said, no, you cannot go with her. And so we started walking to the right, and then my aunt Serena started running after us. And one of the Germans gave her a big hit over the head, and she collapsed in a puddle of her own blood. And when I saw that, I started screaming, Aunt Serena, I'll never see you again in Hungarian. Uh, hearing this, she jumped up with a bleeding face and continued running after us. And then they hit her over the head once more. And the second strike killed her. She fell down in her own puddle of blood and she was not alive anymore. 
that was my beginning of my entry into Auschwitz. We continued walking, my mother and I, and uh, we went through the gates of what now I know it was called Birkenau. At that time we didn't know anything. But we came through Birkenau and we were there for a while. And then we were taken to a camp near Plush, near Krakow, the Polish, the Galicia, Vianus town, Krakow. And next to it was a big, a big camp called Plasho, and from there to other places. I cannot tell you the entire story, but all I can tell you is that my Aunt Serena did not survive. I was with my mother together. Throughout the years, my mother also got very badly injured in Auschwitz. It came to a point that she became such an invalid that she couldn't walk. She was 45 years old, and during the time I was 14, and I had to carry her on my back, I took her two hands on my shoulder, and this is how I walked, and this is how I slept my mother. And so from Auschwitz we went to, to Russia and from Russia to Augsburg and from Augsburg to Dachau. Whole story. It, I cannot tell and you. Can it, I ask it you? It would take days. And uh, Libya, can I ask you in in Dachau? Yes. Um, when you were liberated. Yes. So you mentioned something unbelievable that the American army brought in the the. The priest and the, the mayor. Yes, that wasn't in Dachau. I just want to tell you that from Dachau, we were put on trains. And uh, I don't know where they were planning to take us, but while we were in the trains, for 12 days, trains, no food, no drink. And uh, there was an incident also, which I'm describing in my book, where the American Army, American Air Force, attacked our train. They probably thought that it was a German Army train. They were shooting through the sides and dropping bombs on the top. Terrible, terrible. At least half of the surviving Jew Jewish prisoners were killed in that raid by the Americans. It was horrible. I'm describing it in the book. <clears throat> in the meantime, we also met my brother. I had a four-year-old older brother who was in a different camp. And on the way, on, he was also put on the same train. And at one point where the Americans attacked our Train. We we left the train because we thought the Americans are here. The Germans ran away, and we thought we are liberated. So we got out of the train, and on the train tracks, we met my brother, my mother, and I. It's unbelievable. My brother was in a terrible, terrible shape. He was what was then called the Musulman. A Muslim was called someone who was bones and skin and bones and wasn't able to walk anymore, was in a very, very bad shape. He was just dragging himself. And, uh, and then the Americans, then the news spread that the Germans were coming back. The Americans did not uh, come. Somehow we were just attacked by the American Air Force and the Germans drove us back into the train and at that time my mother took my brother and said I'm not letting him in another train because he was complaining to us that the other prisoners were all putting their 
legs with the shoes on his head as he was lying because he was in such a poor shape that he couldn't sit, he was lying. So my mother says, I'm afraid he's going to get killed. He says, we take him. And my mother tore a piece of her dress uh, and with that piece of schmatte, put it on his head and said, he's a woman. Wow. Make believe. And it could be, you know, we were all skin and bones. Anything was possible. So we took her with uh, took him with us into the train, and it was this thing where the Americans attacked us was on a Shabbat. I remember that we were put on the train on a Thursday afternoon, and uh, and then on Shabbat was the attack by the Americans. This is after, I said, for 12 days. And then eventually, um, in the trains, we were liberated by the American army. We got to a place where the American army already occupied Germany. And uh, where I told you that, where you said, read that he, they called us. When the Americans uh, liberated us, we could leave the train and uh, I was very weak. I could barely walk and so was my brother and my mother, but my brother was the worst. But anyway, we were able to leave the train and we all were lying on the side of the tracks and the Americans uh, went into the town and brought out the elite, the leadership. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you. Okay. Amen. Excuse me. Excuse me, thank you. And, um, and that's where, as we were lying there at the train tracks, um, a German, so they brought out the town where we were liberated was called Seeshaupt a beautiful resort in, in, uh, the, in the, part of, the part of Germany. <coughs> What's that part of Germany suddenly? I forget. In Bavaria. 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 And they, the Americans brought out the elite from the on the leadership, the mayor and the mayor's son, whom I met later, by the way, when he was a grown-up. As a son, he was a five-year-old little boy. And uh, <clears throat> about 50, let's say, Germans from the town. And the Americans said to them, look at these people. Look what you have done to these people and really there were thousands by the way later I read that there were uh, there were about 4,000 of us from different camps and we were in a very bad shape lying and uh, and they says look what you have done this is what your government had done and they said no we have dismissed Kivus we didn't know what's going on. As a matter of fact, one of the German women came over to me as I was lying down <clears throat> and said, and you had to work also? And I said, yes, we had to work. And he says, she says, at your age, this is what must have been very difficult. I said, it was difficult not because of my age, 
but because we didn't get food, we were starved, and that's why it was very difficult to work. And then after, uh, I, I thought, what, what does she mean by my age? And I asked her in German, what do you mean by my age? How, how old do you think I am? And she said, 60, 61, 60 or 61. And I said, lady, I am 14 years old. And she was so shocked. She said, Jesus Maria. And she made the sign of the cross on herself and she walked away. And I thought to myself, yes, I'm only 14, but I have lived a thousand years. And this, what the publishers picked out as a title for the book. That's how the title happened. I have lived a thousand years. So anyway, this was the liberation. And, uh, and you went back to your town? Yes, so we had to stay there because my brother my brother was put into a hospital because he was not well he had first of all he was terribly terribly skinny he was he was completely like skin and bones it was not even possible to recognize him i'm telling the story how my mother didn't recognize him. The, his cheekbones protruded through the skin and he was, uh, the, the skin was infected, so he had pus coming out of his cheekbones. That was that the kind of state he was in. So they put him in a hospital in the local area. So because of him, we stayed over about two months until he was well enough. Maybe not two months, no. I have to read the book. <laughs> but uh, roughly. And uh, then we decided we are able to go home. We were ho hoping that at home we are going to meet the rest of the family. My father, my aunt, uh, <coughs> we had other relatives. So we went home. You know how you went home. First of all, American uh, soldiers put us on trucks, and uh, wherever you belong, you said you were from Poland, so they drove you in that direction. We were from Czechoslovakia, so they drove us to, drove us, drove us, and finally the truck stopped, and we were in the middle of a lovely town that turned out to be Pilsen. That's in Czech, in the Czech Republic. Pilsen, do you know the beer Pilsen? That's from Pilsen, there? yeah. Sure. That's. The, Wow. They stopped in the middle of this town, and all of a sudden I see the factory Pilsen. Pilsener beer. So that's how I knew we were in Pilsen. They stopped there, but that was very far from us, because Czechoslovakia is combined from, with the Czech Republic, which is all the way in the west, near Austria, and Slovakia, which is north of the Danube, uh, miles and miles away. But we had no choice. They just deposited us and went away. So the three of us, my mother, my brother, and I, had to start finding our way home. And uh, what we did was we went to the train station and we inquired which trains are going to the east to, because Slovakia is to the east of Czech, Czech Republic. And there were many Russian soldiers being 
delivered to the east. So we jumped on one of these trains and among the Russian soldiers who were traveling east, <laughs> my mother was very worried because the Russian soldiers were very friendly to me, <laughs> too friendly. But I was only 14. <laughs> and my hair, you have to know, in Auschwitz, they shaved my hair. I was shaved completely bald. When we got there, I had long blonde braids. The braids were all gone, and I was shaved. But during the time I was in Germany, my hair started to grow. So I had a little hair. All around, so I didn't look bad. So my mother had reason to worry <laughs> from the Russian soldiers. Anyway, so we got on the, the train and on another train until we, we came to Bratislava. Bratislava is the capital of Slovakia. And we were very surprised to find that there were some Jews already in Bratislava. There was a, a soup kitchen set up, so we were able to get some soup, and uh, f a few days we stayed in Bratislava, and then we continued on our way. We inquired, there were some horse and buggies that were going to the countryside, because in Shamoria, Shum Shamorin, Shamoria in Hungary, Shamorin, about 18 or 20 kilometers. There, uh, uh, the, the carriages went to buy grain. It was farmer country, so that they, you know, they were buying all kinds of farm, farm goods in Shamorin. So we managed to get on one of those coaches with a horse, horse and buggy, and he brought us to our home. Uh, we, we explained to him where, and brought us to our home, and it was amazing. Our house stood there. I told you it was known as the Friedman Corner. I told you, yes? And it was big sign. Friedman, um, how do you say in Hungarian? Gro Friedman, uh, you know. It, my father had a store, not only grocery, all kinds of wholesale, like a wholesale. Wholesale, store. yeah, no, not wholesale, because it was not wholesale. It was. What do you call, which is not wholesale. A general sale, a general store, maybe a, a general general store, a general one, a general store. A general store, store. that's it. Friedman General wow. Store. And uh, he brought us there, one of the coaches, and we got off. And there was our house completely stripped of oh. everything. They took off the doors, the windows, and the house was completely, you know, all the furniture, everything taken. And in every room, there was a pile of human excrement, the goyim, the fine neighbors that we are. Any, anyway, this is the story we, we got in. My mother went to the neighbors, and asked for straw, and we put that, because there was no furniture, no bed. So she put a pile of straw in the bedroom, and we lied on that, we were very tired. <laughs> All three of us were lying on the straw for a while, and then my brother got up and went into town to find out, you know, who is, who, who arrived. We thought my father would be in the house. He wasn't, so my mother said, maybe he's staying with some other people because we didn't come home and the house was empty. So my 
brother went into town and uh, for a, oh yes we heard that my father is on his way home some people saw him so my brother went to find out in which town he is and then he came back with a piece of paper which I still have a brown I mean a yellow piece of paper that said he died on the third day of Cholamoy Pesach between two and three in the afternoon. Yeah. It turned out that there was somebody who was with him. He came home, but he didn't live in our town, in another town. So he wrote down this information and he gave it to some people in town, some Jews in town, so that they should transfer it to us. So this is how my brother came home. And I remember that we were standing, we had no chairs, or, so my mother and I were standing in the kitchen. And he came in and he said, push me down, he said, sit down. I must rend the tear in your dress because we have to sit shiver for daddy. He died on Pesach, and this was already the end of June. So he says the halacha is that if somebody died more than 40 days ago, then you sit shiva only for an hour. And so he pushed me down, he tore my dress, pushed me down, and I sat down next to my mother on the ground, and we sat for an hour, she was, because daddy wasn't coming home. That was a big, big shock to me. First of all, I was very attached to my father. I loved him very much. He was a big time with Hakam, and simultaneously, he loved sport. He was very athletic. He knew how to swim, he taught me to swim. He knew how to skate, any sport. And I was very, I had a tendency for athletics. But my brother, no, my brother was not, he was a good tummy tuck, huh? But he was, my father called him Der Bleier Feiger, the leaden bird. He wasn't able to do athletics very well. So anyway, my father didn't come home, and we had to start making a li our life from then on. I cannot... Livia, can I just ask you, you tell the most amazing thing what happened with the photograph, that you, you heard about that there was a photographer that took photos. Yes, yes. Could you just mention, because this is something unbelievable. You read about sure. it. So before we were taken away, there was a Dafka the day before we were taken away, there was a German photographer in town who decided to take a picture of everybody and I don't know why. I asked him and he said, Do we, you will get a Ken card, you will get an ID card, so we need your photos. But we never got any can cut. So he gathered all the townsfolk into one hall and he took pictures of us. And the interesting part was that, I mean, I wrote that in the book, that he told the men, Mütze up, take off your hats. And uh, the town was a religious town, so all the men had their head covered. We didn't have kippot. Mm -hmm. That was a later development. All the men had hats. My father had a hat, my brother had a cap. So when he sa said, take off your hats, 
because he wanted to take a picture without hats. And everybody took off the hat, even the Rav, or Rav, Rav Singer, was an older man with a long white beard and long white face. And he also took off his hat. I remember to me it was such a shocking sight to see the Rav without, without the hat and his beard and, and, and and the only person who didn't take off his hat was my father. And they said to him, Er Mordche, he said, take off your hat. He says, I'll take off my hat when I will stand before him and he'll take my picture and he'll tell me to take off the hat. But why do I have to send Borapeti in the meantime? And sure enough, can you imagine? I don't know why. Everybody was like sheep, like Tzon Lateva. The boys said, take off your hats. They all took off their hats. And they were all religious Jews. And the Rav, the Vadai, took off his hat. And my father had his hat on. And when he stood before the photographer, he didn't tell him to take off the hat. And that's the reason why I found his picture, because when I came back, I was looking for the photographer. He was not there anymore, because we were already occupied by Russian army. So he ran away, and uh, I went through all the drawers looking for pictures. Then I went into the backyard, where there were two large a basket full of negatives, which were glass. At that time, there was no plastic yet. Such square glass, and uh, much of the baskets with the glass, the top layers were clean glass, because it had been raining. And but I emptied and I managed to find my father's picture because he had his hat on. That's how I was able to know this is it. Otherwise, how can you tell? There were hundreds of these glass plates with these dark shadows on it. You couldn't tell who it is. I could tell the Rov because he was the only one with a beard. So I put it aside and I found my father's picture and I found my picture because I was the only girl with braids. Nobody had braids because I had very straight hair and my mother was sick and tired of putting curlers in my hair. So she decided to, to make braids. Braids, Jewish girls didn't wear braids, but my mother made braids and you know what it saved that's your what saved our lives wow that's what so i found the glass if you want to know i can show you i have those two glass plates you've got the glass plates yes i brought them with me i wow. brought them all over because first of all there was no photographer in town after the war. So I went to Bratislava. And there the photographer said, no, we cannot make copies from glass. We cannot. Because at, at that time, it was no longer the style. So in America, I took them with me to America. And there, it so happens, I didn't even want to make as pictures because I thought from glass it's impossible. So I wrote my first book. I started writing. And when my first book was being published, the publishers, it was called the New York Times Book Company that published my first book. And they said, we want to have a picture on, on the book. I said, I have no pictures. And then I said, you know what, I have these glass plates. Do you think it's possible 
to make a picture from this. He says, sure, now it's computerized, everything. And they made a picture out of, for my father and for me, out of those glass plates. So that's the first time when I saw my own picture also. And it is used on the cover of the book. I lived a thousand lives. I have lived a thousand, thousand lives. years. A thousand years. A thousand. Yeah. yeah, a thousand lives would have been better. But it's, <laughs> it, it was a thousand <laughs> I have it so, so they have a picture on that. And I have the glass plates. <laughs> you are interested, I can go. Very much. Libby, can I just ask you, um, when you give a talk, you always say that you survive for a purpose and you make it your purpose to to combat intolerance and uh, yes. and and hatred one for another and, um, and also prejudice. You're very against prejudice. Yes, yes, yes. Because what happened in the Shoah was because of prejudice. It was the, the hatred of the Jews. If there wouldn't have been prejudice, there wouldn't have been any Shoah. And Libby, what, what message did you always give your students? And what message would you give, what message would you give to, to the future generations? Because you've lived the most amazing, not only a thousand years, a thousand lives, <laughs> but miracles, really miracles. Well, future you so generations, positive. we are in Israel, but whenever I was abroad, all over, I give lectures in Canada, in England, all over. I was taken to the north of England, all over. And I say to them, Eretz Israel, the fact that we have a land, this is why another Holocaust cannot happen. Because first of all, a people who has a land is a people with power. They would never dare do to the Jews what they did to us. We didn't have a land. Now we have Eretz Israel. So number one, the Jews are looked upon very differently. Anti-Semitism will never achieve what they achieve because we have Eretz Israel, the land of Israel, the state of Israel. And secondly, or maybe more importantly, whenever a hatred of Jews would arise anywhere, the Jews can come to Israel. Yeah. They have a place to run to. Wow. No? We had no place to go. We were in the hands of the anti-Semites because we had nowhere to go. Now the Jews have a place to go. That's well, a big difference. And Libya, what I find is incredible is that you kept your faith. You remained, yes. you, you, your, your belief religious. in Hashem, yes. in God, and your faith. Yes, yes. And you remained religious after all you, you know saw. Why? Do you Do you know your Pasuk? What's your Pasuk? A Pasuk according to your name. Every person, every Jew has a Pasuk. What's your name? Mans Eliezer. Yes. Do you know your Pasuk? You see, not everybody took the Pasuk seriously. In my hometown, as soon as I was a little girl, I was taught my Pasuk. My brother was taught his Pasuk. My brother is Simcha Tzvi. He had two Pasuki, Simcha and Tzvi. A Pasuk is where a line, a Pasuk from Tehillim, where the first letter of your name corresponds to the first letter of the Pasuk and the last letter of your name to the last letter. My Hebrew name is Leah and my Pasuk is Lo Amut Ki Echye Vasaper Maaseka Lamed the first letter and hey, 
the last letter. Lo amu. And when I was a little girl, I was already told my pasuk. And do you know that this is what helped me survive? During the worst times, I kept saying, Lo amuski ethye. Lo Amus, I, at one point, we were taken on a march and my mother couldn't walk anymore. And I was very, very weak. And I was slapping her like this. And at one point, I was so weak that I myself fell down and the both of us were lying down. And it was time to die. You know, many people died as we were walking. They were too weak, they couldn't continue. They dropped down, and two minutes later they were dead because we were so starved. We were at the end of our koach, at the end of our life, uh, whatever. No strength, you had no strength. No strength. So I kept saying my basur. I remember at one time I fell down as I was slipping my mother and we were lying for a few minutes because I couldn't walk and I said Lo amus kie hie va saper ma seka Lo amus kie hie va saper ma seka Lo amus I kept saying it and it gave me koa I will not die and this is why there's no question that my pasuk helped me live. It helped me keep my mother alive. When we came home, survived, I said to myself, my pasuk is lo amut kiekje va saper ma seka. Now I didn't die, but the second half of my pasuk I have also to fulfill. Va saper ma I have to do Jewish studies, Torah studies, because that's ma'aseka, ma'aseya. Nachon? The Torah, where are the ma'asim of the Kadosh Baruch Hu described? In the Torah, as soon as we settled down, I went in Bratislava, they organized already a Bes Yaakov seminary. There was an organization of Aguda. My brother went also, there was a yeshiva. You saw the Hatoira. You saw the Torah. My brother went and came back from Bratislava and says, you know what? There is a school for girls. I wasn't at all <clears throat> educated in Jewish studies. We were religious Jews, Orthodox. My mother wore a shaito. But I didn't know anything about Yiddishkeit or Jewish history or history of Israel. I knew the broches, every broche. I knew what broche to say for what. And uh, I knew how to dabble, but I didn't know any Jewish studies. And my brother came home from Bratislava and said, you know what, there is a girls' school. And I went in, and I wrote about it in the book, that I studied uh, in the Beis Yaakov Seminary. And very soon after I finished, I became a teacher of Beis Yaakov. I was a Besyakov teacher for a number of years in Bratislava. And then I also got a job teaching Jewish children who went to public school were allowed to have two hours a week of Jewish studies. They were Jewish children, Christian children also had two hours to study their religion. So I was also teaching those little girls from public schools. Those who survived, many of them had no parents. Many of them. I'm writing about this too. That 
there was a little girl, for instance, who didn't know her name. She didn't know. She survived. She was hidden in a monastery. And in the monastery, they gave her a Christian name, Todaraba. And, um, but she didn't know her Jewish name. You know what I mean? Some Maria, such name she had. And she didn't want that name. So I gave her a name. What was the name I gave? Malka. Okay. I said, you're a queen. I gave her the name Malka. Todaraba. That's it. What more do you want? And then you, 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 you got a, your doctorate? In yes, so when we came home, I went back to school, yes. I went back to, uh, I didn't finish high school. Bulgari in Hungary was the high school. So they had an arrangement for people who did not in the war, so I passed an exam, it was called Maturitni Diploma, and I, get a, I got a high school diploma. Uh, it took about two or three days to study. They, I found out when the exam is, and they told me what it was, and I studied, and I passed the exam. So I had a diploma, and then when we got to the United States, I went to Brooklyn College. Right away, a few, a few weeks later, because we got there, I remember, RF Pesa to America. And then that fall, I already started Brooklyn College in the evening, night school, because during the day I had to work, because my mother became an invalid. She had an accident in Auschwitz, I don't know if you read the book, that the, so she really, she wasn't able to work, and uh, we had to eat. I had to provide for my mother, so I was working, I got a job teaching already there, and then in the evening I went to Brooklyn College. And so, Baruch Hashem, I graduated Brooklyn College with a BA, and then I went on to NYU also at night. I studied at NYU. I got my MA and then my PhD. I went for the PhD also. I wrote the history of Zionism in Hungary. That was my PhD thesis. It, it, it got published, it so happens. Um, how did it get published? Oh yes. <laughs> Muzzle, you know, everything. How do you get things published? I was invited in America. Did you hear the name of Shifra Hoffman? Mm -hmm. I have, yeah. You heard? He's a sh what, what did he's you? He's a Shifra Hoffman in Israel as well. But she's... Uh, Maybe it's the with same. A, with the OU, she... With the OU, the Union of Orthodox. I didn't know that she in Israel. Is she still alive? She's an elderly lady. I think she's still alive. Could be the same. She's very involved in. Must be the in, same in, in, woman. In very Zionistic. Uh, Everything. Shifra Hoffman, sure. She was in America. She's very active. Very active in in Israeli causes, in oh Zionistic my. So causes. Then the, do you know how I can find her? I'm sure I've got her number. I'll give you her number afterwards. Oh my oh, Olivia, God. Olivia, with the greatest of pleasure. I know she found I can't believe it. I know she found her, sure. 
and she's still alive. I am already 90 years old, and Shifa was older than I. No? I think she's about... She, she's... She's no. more than 90. Maybe 91, 92. Yes. Shifra Hoffman, in, she always invited me to speak. She was a follower of Meir Kahan. Yes, she's still alive. Yes. Yeah. And there was an organization, there was a dinner of uh, the Jewish idea. And the Jewish idea was Meir Kahane's group, a very right-wing group, the Jewish idea. She said, we have a dinner, the Jewish idea, and I need a speaker. And I said, sorry, Shifra, I can't, because I started to write my story. That's when I started to write and that was the book that came out, Ellie, Coming of Age in the Holocaust. And I had the book. I've got the book. That's the book. I had book. it many years ago. That's the book that I was just writing. And I decided to write it down because I met my husband. And my husband encouraged me to write. And that's how I started writing with his encouragement. I'll and, get your number. And Shifra said to me, listen, bring along the pages that you're writing. Anything that you will say is good enough for me, please. So the Jewish idea, I figured it's a very right-wing Jewish group. So I brought along the pages in which I was writing how the, in the ghetto, they burned the Sifre Torah. For me, it was very emotional that the Sifre Torah were burned. There's a whole detail. And she says, bring that, and you'll read those pages, and everybody will be happy. So I thought the Jewish idea is going to be a Kahanist group, very from right-wing Jews, and they love, they will be moved by the description how the Sifrei Torah were burned in the ghetto. And then when I'm sitting there on the dais, uh, next to me it so happens there was a man sitting who said to me, what are you going to talk about? So I said, uh, I'll talk about my experiences during the World War. At that time, they didn't have the word Holocaust. Uh, I'm not <laughs> they sure. Did. They didn't have the word Shoah. Shoah, sure, no. Just I said during World War II. And he says, what for instance? I said, I'm not ready to talk about. And then he was Chase, Ned Chase, who was the president of Times Books, which was the New York Times Book Company. It doesn't exist anymore, it went out of business. But at that time, the New York Times had a publishing house, a book publishing house, it was called the New York Times. So, he says to me, I am the president of New York Times Book Company, and I'm willing to publish your book now you're ready to tell, because it so happens when I spoke about how, oh yes, I thought the Jewish idea, all the people are right-wing Jews. You know who was there? Only Goyim, Italian-Americans. Why? Because there was an Italian-American, I don't know if you remember, he worked for the immigration department, and he discovered that America admitted Nazis, former Nazis who had nowhere to go, to hide out, they were admitted to the United States. And he wrote a book about it, Nazis in America, in an Italian name. And he was honored by Mayor Kahane. So the dinner 
was dedicated to him, honoring him. And all the audience were Italian goyim who came to give him honor, so not Jews. So, and I brought to speak about how the Sifre Torah were burned. So I had no choice. I'm sitting in the dais, and I see not a single Jew in the audience. They're all American, uh, Italian American going. I had no choice. <laughs> I was reading the pages, telling the story how the Sifre Torah were burned. And these Italians were so moved by it, they all cried. Wow. <laughs> they were all crying. One of them came up to me, says, my name is, and he told me his Italian name, I want you to know nothing could ever stop me from eating, but hearing your story made me cry and I couldn't eat. It was a dinner. It was a dinner. <laughs> So when these guys saw how these Italians were moved, and so then he said to me, I am the president of New York Times Book Company, and I'm willing to publish your book, because I spoke about it, that I'm just writing it. I, it wasn't written yet. And he says, now you're willing to tell me who you are, because I wasn't going to tell. I was a young woman. And he was a guy, a guy, a guy, he wants my phone number, I'm not going to give it to him. Turned out that he was the president mm -hmm. of New York Times Book Company. So I gave him my phone number and they published the book. My first book was published by them. And it's very difficult to get your first book published. You know, it's a very difficult thing. If you already have one book published, already you have more chance to publish the others. And this is what happened. They published the book. And after that, you know, I have lived a thousand years and a number of seven books were published. After. Well, well, I've lived a thousand years. Is what? It's actually sold out in many bookshops. It's been sold out. Yes, so they're reordering. They re yes. I get, I get uh, royalties, yes. It's, it's the most amazing book. I get book. royalties. And then I wrote uh, a uh, continuation called My Bridges of Hope that described the period after the war. And then there is a continuation, Hello America. I described how a Holocaust survivor makes it in America, you know, uh, as I came to the United States. So that's three books. And then I wrote, oh yes, this, you know, very quickly another story. My mother, she was 90 years old. Now I'm 90. My mother was 90 years old. She was in an old age home in Natanya. Deferred Banim. And somebody came from our hometown and visited her <coughs> and told her that they are building a dam on the Danube, the Danube River. You know of the Danube. Now, our town was very near the Danube. As a matter of fact, I learned how to swim in the Danube. We were walking to the Danube. My father taught me to swim in the Danube. And that they're building a dam in the Danube, and the whole area on the banks of the Danube will be flooded. And uh, the Jewish cemetery, the old Jewish cemetery, was on the bank of the Danube and my mother's parents were buried there. You know, the Shoah wiped out everybody else. There was no cemetery afterwards, but this was the old cemetery. And she said to me, my four brothers and two sisters went like smoke to heaven from Auschwitz. 
and now my parents are going to be swept away by the waves of the Danube, who knows where. She said, you have to do something. You are able to do things. Please go and dig up my parents' graves and bring them to Israel for burial. Such a job she gave me. She was 90 years old. And I said, how can I do it? Slovakia was at that time a Stalinist communist country. And for me, it was very dangerous to go back there because after the war, I got the job of teaching Jewish children in public schools. As I told you, they had two hours off, and it was called religion, religious study. And I got the job, and but being a worker in a communist country, you had to be a member of the communist party. Being that I was a teacher, officially, I had to join the Communist Party and become an official member. Now, for him, and then I, I ran away in 1949, illegally. I wrote a book about that too. How, with my mother, we ran, we escaped through the border into Austria and went through forests, Austrian forests. I have to read it because it was an amazing experience until we managed to reach Vienna, the American zone. You know, Vienna was divided in four parts, just like Berlin and Vienna. The Russian zone, the French zone, the American zone, and the British zone. And we wanted to reach the American zone in Vienna, because in the meantime, we found out that my brother is alive, and he's in America at Yeshiva University. Yeshiva University sent visas for young people. He was 17 years old, and he was in America. So we had to get to America. We couldn't stay there. I wanted to go to Israel. But my mother says, look, your brother is in America. You want to go to Israel. What should I do? Should I cut myself in two? So this is how I agreed to go to the United States. I didn't want to, but because of my brother, we got to the United States. So, where was I? <laughs> so with the, the graves, did you manage to bring, the lady asked you, asked you as a favor to bring back the Kforim when they were going to build the mother, dam? My mother asked me. The lady was my mother. My mother was 90 years old. That was already later. And a friend, a friend in, came to tell your America, mother that they're building... In the United States. They're building already, the dam. Yes, and that they're building a dam. You can bring the quarium back to you. And she her. said, my parents' bodies will be swept away by the Danube. Ellie, my name was Ellie. You must do something. So it took me two years until I collected all the paperwork. I needed their birth certificates, my grandparents, their death certificates, a permission of, I'll have to read the book, what, how, until it was two years until I collected all the paperwork because uh, Czechoslovakia was a communist country and in order to to go to to wherever to go back there I had to have they required a number of certificates so that until I collected 
the best thing was I went to my brother at that time and I told him that what my mother wants that I should go back and bring, and back bring her up. Parents. And he said, I said, are you coming with me? I need you because you see, I was a member of the Communist Party and I, I ran away illegally. If I go back, I can be arrested any time. Because at that time, Czechoslovakia was still a Stalinist communist country. And my brother said, no. I can do it. And this is one thing I don't understand. Why my brother didn't want to go with me. I will never understand. So my husband, by that time I was married to Len Jackson. He was an Irishman. He was a physician, Dr. Len Jackson. So he said to me, I go with you. And if you get in an, any kind of trouble, I have a British passport. I can always go to the British Embassy and try to help you. So he volunteered to come with me. Without him, I couldn't have done it because I needed... I was in a very serious trouble if I was being, would be caught yeah. in Slovakia. Anyway, we went back and I wrote a book about it. The title is Saving What Remains. I brought back the remains. And you brought it back? I brought back my grandparents' remains and they are buried here in Haramenuchot and next to my grandmother, my mother is buried. Unbelievable. And now I bought a plot a few meters away, I found the plot. But uh, Livia, I bought it for myself. We've got many years, and maybe three to 120, we've got still many you years. Imagine? But wow. you know what? That reminds me, I have to call up my friend Sammy. Do you know a fellow called Sammy Hevroni? He's a macher type, he's a very good friend of mine. And he's the one who is now negotiating the price because the original price of the plot was $20,000. But I said, I'm willing, if I can be buried a few meters away from my mother and my grandparents, I brought their, their bones here. But living you're only 90, we still got at least 30 more years yes. of good years of battle and progress. But anyway, it has to be. Oh, wow. But you know what? So Sammy said he's negotiating the price of uh, $20,000. It's a little too high. Livia, I just want to mention something to you. I'm going to come, I'll be a little bit away. Um, I just want to mention, because you mentioned I'm just going to sit over here for a second, but now you just go back to it. You cannot see. I know, me. just for a second. I just <laughs> want to thank you so much, Livia. Thank you so very much. <laughs> you mentioned um, about the name. My late grandmother is a Hava, and her Hebrew name is Zot Manuchati Adei Ad Poshet Kiavitia. You and she know was her buried, sure, And she was buried on Haraz Eitim. Wow. And she always wanted to be buried, she wanted to live in Israel. And her name is, this is the resting place because I have desired it. From where? From, uh, from Tanakh, her name. No, but Zahava, from where did you bring From, from South Africa. From South Africa, from Johannesburg. She was, and she's buried in Harris 18. Oh, but really? I just want to thank you so much from the bottom of my heart. At may be stream to 120 in good health, Mazel and Brocha. Thank you very much. Oh, Olivia, this has thank been so much. absolutely something very, very, very special. And I cannot thank you enough, Olivia. Thank you. You thank are, thank you are an absolutely nice. You're a miracle, <laughs> and you inspire, and you what thank you've you only achieved, much. and you're so positive. We have so much to learn from you, yes, Olivia. Yes, positive. And you've got That's a you've got many, many more years. Yes, to give and over and to stories. enjoy Nachas from many your family. Many more stories. Yes. All the very best. Thank you very much.
Olivia, this is your, your book, I've Lived a Thousand Years. And in the, in the book, you have the picture that you found, the original... Yes. Where you have your braids. That's the picture that was taken the day before we were taken away. That's the German photographer. I managed to, to find the glass. Here is the glass, you'll see it. If you could show us the glass, that's... I'm just so afraid it shouldn't fall. Because my it's right... It's very valuable. My right hand... It's irreplaceable. My right hand shakes. And that was in the original box. Yes. That's my father. Wow, and you can see your father with the with the hat on. Yeah. That's how you recognize that was your father. Yes. You took it. Here is the piece of paper that says that my father died and this is my see my braids you can see the braids wow. I would have never recognized it but among the many glass and Libby could you read and from the, the piece of paper it's the only the piece of paper, paper is in Hungarian it says Mechholt means died 1945 April 2nd between 2 and 3 in the afternoon and now I don't know what else is written here because I'll have to get out my glasses Maybe this is priceless. It's this yeah. is the most valuable. Yes. <laughs> and you couldn't find the picture of your your mother or your no, your brother. Because it was so not only and my aunt who didn't survive. No way you can imagine. I would have had to keep at least a hundred glasses. You saw the glass. But it's a miracle that it survived. Yes. And this was after the war. Yes. It's a miracle. And I found it in the backyard of the German photographer. And here it says, I don't have my glasses. Maybe I have it here. So I should be able to read it. <laughs> I love you, thank you so much. When you are 90, things are a little bit tough. That you, you are a very young 90. <laughs> yes. If you see me dance, I love to dance. <laughs> so everybody laughs. They say, Livia, dance, and I dance. <laughs> yeah, here it says in Hungarian, Died 1945, April 2nd, afternoon, between 3 and 5. And then it says, Hushvet Khol Hamoed, Sir Armadikna, Ali Tolagos, Hobarnes. It was shake. In Hungarian, it says that he died, and the reason was 
that they claim that he had a Hungarian Orbans swelling of the legs uh, as a result of, uh, of some infection. So he, you see what happened was, it's, it's difficult to understand this, but what happened was that this guy, he signed his name, Kemen Pal. Pal is Paul in Hungarian. Kemen, it's a Hungarian name, in Budapest, and he gave the address, Nyarutsa Khamesh. So my mother and I, we went there to speak to him to get detail because it turned out that he was with my father together in bergen Belsen and they were always close. And then it turned out that my mother realized that his mother was a second cousin to, to my mother. And he didn't really know that they were related. He was just friendly with my father in bergen Belsen, And he says that when the British came, the Germans ordered all the uh, prisoners to stand on line, Zelapel. I don't know why. So it seems that he says he already stood on Zelapel. He was waiting for my father to show up. It turned out that my father was just coming down from the third, uh, you know, the beds were layered on the third round, and as he was coming down, a German shot him. Mm. So that he went in, and this was after liberation by the British, mm. and this friend of his, the one who wrote, went inside, he didn't know what takes him so long to come out, and he saw a pile of corpses and on the very top was my father bleeding very heavily so he knew that he was just shot just a short time before that's why he was still bleeding very heavily and he was on top of the pile that's it what? so he was liberated already Christ. by the british when the German killed him. He was 45 years old. 45? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, this is your... If you could just hold us again, Livia, it's such a... This is... This it's one, a miracle. This one is a better picture, I think. They're both amazing, Livia. But my... The German... The... Yes, the German edition, what am I talking about? The Hebrew edition of my book has my full picture. I could bring it down, but I don't know if I'll find it. Well, Livia, thank you so much. And this has the, my, f you know, the picture is not cut like here. And that was the only picture that you had? From that so glass slide. That glass, I the showed glass. you. I know, it's that glass, that this piece is the of glass. It's and incredible. my father, we have nobody, mm. nobody's picture. Because you can imagine, I go through hundreds and just a little black, little black and white on the glass. It's not possible to recognize. I just recognize myself and my father because of the hat. Well, it's, it's a miracle, and your story is a yes. miracle, and you are a miracle. Yeah. And Livy, you must just, <laughs> you are such an inspiration and Thank somebody you. we can all just learn so much from and emulate and, <laughs> and inspire. You. you inspire everybody. And you must you. just have muzzle and broch and good health. Thank you very much. And Japlot that you, that you are buying, you don't need it for Bidrat Hashem many, many, many <laughs> more years. Yes, but the plot is there. So 